Hi there. My name is Sawyer. Um, thank you for inviting me to your school. It's a great opportunity to come back down to Connecticut. Um, although I grew up in California, I really New England is definitely my home. And I've, I was just relating as how I went through here. My ex-husband doesn't live too far from here, so I kind of had the chills as I was driving down, so <laughs> just a little bit. Um, but yeah, thank you, and thank you for that great introduction as well. Um, there'll be a test on that part later on. You guys won't be able to connect the dots at all. Where was she when? That's whatever. I used to say I just commute for work, and people get it from there. But thank you for having me here. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, traumatic brain injuries, mild traumatic brain injuries. And we're also going to talk about their connection into this whole thing about PTSD. What's PTSD? You guys know? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Think it's affecting our country right now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is absolutely huge. And back in the day when I, you know, I was, I was born when the earth was still cooling and dinosaurs were roaming the earth and things like that. Back in those days, we didn't have a helmet for anything. I bet if you looked in your closets right now, you'd find four or five helmets for every single event that you do. And it's important for you guys to wear those helmets because of what we're going to talk about today. It really is an important facet of this. And if you're not protecting yourself, you're going to run into some problems later on. So without further ado, first of all, does anyone have any questions? Any other random questions? You're all scared. I don't know, is she a military person or is she a hippie from Vermont? I don't know. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, you're trained to kill us. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my line is, I'll kill you as soon as heal you. <laughs> so that'll work for you, all right? <clears throat> I have no problem killing people. All right. This is what we're going to talk about. Traumatic brain injuries, what happens to them, uh, the mechanisms to get a traumatic brain injury. We're going to talk about some symptoms, some anticipated problems for what happens when you whack your head hard enough for your brain to be injured, uh, which is an important thing to understand. Some care for this. And then uh, we're going to link this over to post-traumatic stress disorder and talk about some of the statistics for that. Okay? How do you know if someone's injured their brain? What do you think? Headaches. Headaches? What else? Dizzy? Last time you whacked your head, what did you feel? Nothing? <laughs> You're like, I woke up on the floor the next day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What are you worried about? We're, we need to be able to recognize this traumatic brain injury because if we hit our heads enough, this is the problem. If you hit your head enough, it is cumulative. Okay? And you guys don't remember so much Muhammad Ali, who used to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, but now he has Parkinson's disease. And it's directly related to the number of whacks he got in his head. Okay, this is why some, uh, some of our professional sports have said, this is bad. And if people get knocked out too many times, they need to leave the scene. Because we don't want them getting these brain injuries later on. Now, it, it's, it's cumulative, but it's even more important when you whack your head once, and then you whack it again really quickly, without full recovery, as best you can. That's going to cause some serious damage to your brain. You only got one brain. And let me tell you, I'm here to say, if you mess with your brain after a while, it'll mess with you back. Okay? It will mess with you back. Um, I've hit my head enough times. I've broken helmets that I've been wearing. Um, I've been to war a couple of times now. Okay? And, and there's all sorts of things that I can't remember. I have conversations with my friends that I can't remember that I've had before. And that's a scary feeling, especially because I'm a type A personality. You know, you like to be in control. Imagine not remembering. That's, that's not OK. All right, so that's how it messes with you back. And it's, and it's a little bit rough. Okay? All right, so how do you hit your head? We get to this, uh, the video section here. How do you guys hit your head? Hit your head doing stupid things, don't you? Right? This is what we do. Back in the days, so we're going to give you some little examples of what it is. So this is hitting your head. This is a real quick one with skateboard, right? Ooh. You guys want to see that one again? How quick is that? Let's see that one again. Hit your head. Boom. OK? A little bit rough. Okay, it, that'll happen. It's a quick one. One more time for you guys. <laughs> Just think I'm cool. That guy is going to have a rough day. Okay, here's not. You don't skateboard? Where is it? What about bicycles? These are all, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 I hate it when that happens. Oh. 
This is my favorite. Does that sound like a good idea? I'm going to get a van and get my stupid buddy to drive it while I hold a rope and it's going to pull me fast enough so I think I might be able to clear a building? Okay. Yeah, this is what you guys are all like. It seemed like a really good idea at the time. That's what it is, right? But certainly that happens. I don't know about you, but when I was little, I'm the youngest of seven and that's kind of what happened to me. Okay, so what happened was they, they would say and sit there, all my brothers and sisters would be doing something and they'd be like, you know, I'm not sure this is safe. Let's try it out on Sawyer. Let's put her in the tire and roll her down the hill to see if that's okay. And if she comes out all right, then we'll all try it. Same thing, right? Let, let, let's put her in the sled, slide her down. Let's put her on the saddle of the horse. And if she doesn't fall off, then it must be tight enough. Okay? These are the things that people do when they think it's a good idea at the time, right? But it's not just boys. It's you too, ladies, right? What can you do? And if you say this hasn't happened to you, you need to say it hasn't happened to you yet, right? <laughs> Ow! Right into the pole. I've done that not into a pole, but certainly into a door, right? You open the door and you think you're through, whack, oh, missed it, missed it, okay? Sports. We have a lot of sports that are notorious for head injuries like um, football and boxing and those types of things. Up in Vermont, we, uh, we can't organize those sports. We got one of these. Now look at the Here comes this is Brock. snowmobiling. There's nothing Brock can do, and Jones has no idea what's coming. And here it is. Oh. Frightening video. He made it through alive. What do you think would have been the consequence if he wasn't wearing a helmet? Yeah, that would have been, that would have been really, really bad. Okay? Couple hundred pounds landing on your head, not so good. And you all down here have some seemingly safe sports, right? Are they? Maybe, maybe not. You gotta watch this one close. Poof! Oh, you wanna watch that one again? This poor girl. She tried hard, but she totally pegged her face. That's gotta hurt. That's stuff like road burn. Puff. Oh, okay. This is what happens. Everyday life, everyday things, you whack your head, you don't even think about it, right? She probably got up, looked around, and said, I hope nobody saw that. Of course, it's on video now, right? And now she's on YouTube. Um, <laughs> bummer, 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 all right? And you know, adults can make these mistakes too. This is a fantastic video of a, of a college, a college sponsored event, where the idea was that you needed to steal, borrow furniture from your dormitory and make a vehicle out of it. And that was pretty much the only criteria, right? So we can see what happens here. Needless to say, this, con this uh, college is not doing this anymore. Oops, let me look at, let me get back to this one. They didn't say anything about it needing to steer. <laughs> So, we're going to see some slow motion. <laughs> They're trying hard. Yeah, that guy gets up and bails on his kids. She gets whacked in the head. Look at the amount of force. <laughs> yeah, so that's adding insult to injury with the couch, isn't it? That's not okay. Yeah, they all, uh, <laughs> amazingly enough, they all made it through that event as well. Uh, but these things can happen absolutely, and certainly you can see in that slow motion the total amount of force that these people are taking, not only on their head, but on their spine as well. Think these people's brains got knocked? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We got one more, and these things can happen to you too. This, this talks a little bit about karma, right? Oop, wait, there we go. Where is it? Sorry. Karma. You being a good sport about things, otherwise this will happen to you. <laughs> yep. They're a little they're a little 
thank you. <laughs> They're a little rough in the UK. <laughs> okay. Yep, yep. So what happens is there's a lot of ways you guys can knock your head. Okay? How do people wearing my suit get, get their head knocked? What do you think? Um, shrapnel is, yeah, that can injure your head. Yep, yeah, if it goes into your head. I've had my, head, my thumb in somebody's head who had shrapnel in their head. It was a grim prognosis. Yep, what else? Yeah, loud noise is kind of like explosions, right? <laughs> explosions. Things getting blown up. One of the things that we worry about is these blast injuries, and these are the these are the ones we're we're really having a trouble a, a huge problem with. Um, you know, the IED, the improvised explosive device that is out there on the roadsides while our military folks are driving down the roads and people get blown up, they have these issues. Um, if you haven't seen the new vehicles that we drive when we're out there, boy, I tell you, Batman's got nothing on us. Okay, those vehicles are totally freaking cool. The tires are as big as me. They are incredible pieces of equipment. Um, the problem with it, though, is that they've solved the problem of being blown up in terms of hurting yourself, but it doesn't solve the problem of this blast injury because you still have the concussive force. And previously, you might have heard of some of these brain injuries as concussions, right? And we're bringing back that terminology just a little bit because that's what's actually, actually happening. These concussive forces and these blast injuries are messing people's brains up. Okay? So when we have someone who's hurt, who's hurt themselves, either through trauma because they whacked their head, or they get blown up in this concussive type of force, we have to ask ourselves, is your brain injured? How would you know? How would you know if your brain is injured? Oh, that's just battle fatigue. Okay. How would you know if your brain is injured? If you're, if you're unable to remember the manpower. Yeah, well, a big part of it, too, is you start out with this guy here. Um, well, let me go back to that one, sorry. What you want to know, we have, this, uh, we have, we have acute mil uh, military acute concussion evaluation. This is a MACE device here. And, it's, and what it is, it's an, an examination that talks about the criteria to see if your brain has actually been injured. Okay? It goes through this whole elaborate process, and it's really fantastic. It makes you memorize numbers. You have to ask for uh, the, the dates backward, the months backward. Okay? It has, you have to give people uh, five words like apple, bubble, elbow, you know, shadow. Okay? And then five, ten minutes later, ask them to remember these, these names again and these, and these words. And what happens is you keep score as you go through whether or not they can do this, that type of thing. Okay? and then whether or not they know themselves or any information. And out of 30, at the end of this, it determines whether or not they have a brain injury, which is fantastic, okay? which is absolutely fantastic. It's a lot of fun, especially for people who don't score very well. You can kind of make fun of them. But one of the problems that we ran into is that we had two issues with this MACE test. One is soldiers like to be soldiers. Okay? Soldiers really like to be soldiers. They, boy, let me tell you, the demographic of 18 to 24 year old males keeps me in busy as a medic. Okay? It is job security. Those guys hurt themselves all the freaking time. It's fantastic. I'm never a dull moment. Okay? They have great injuries too. It's, it's really neat. But the problem is, is that they are mission focused. They want to make sure they get the mission done. And in order to do that, they don't care as much about themselves. So they get whacked upside the head, they get blown up, and they want to stay in the fight. They're there to fight. They're there to do their job. They don't want to go home. So what happens is, these mace cards get out there, and the guys start memorizing the numbers and the letters. Right? So then you're like, all right, I'm going to go to version B. And they're like, oh, version B? That's you know, peach, knuckle, hill. And they know it. And they know it, because they want to stay in the game. So how do you evaluate that person? Well, geez, he's got long-term memory, but maybe not new memory. And that could be one of the problems. Um, so, and then the other issue with it is that you know, I went out with, uh, to war with Vermont when we used this. And uh, you know. Vermont's not quite like Connecticut. We had to start out of 30 points. Our baseline was like 28. Okay, so everyone that went out there already had a, had a brain injury a little bit just being from Vermont. So we had to kind of move that up a little bit and say, hmm, what's going on with this, right? <laughs> what happens is that if they do think that you have a brain injury, if you run in a, in a higher zone, for example, for uh, 25 to 30, what they say is you have an MTBI, a mild traumatic brain injury. And that mild traumatic brain injury is going to be watched for a little while, and then we're going to send them right back into the field. Okay? You get three mild traumatic brain injuries, you're out of the game. Okay? If you have a traumatic brain injury, 
which is a severe one, and that's you know, 25 and below on this score, then you're, you're going home. Okay? You're going home because you have some significant deficit and significant injury, and we're going to send that person home. So they really need a scale for this, which is fantastic because the, um, you know, the military isn't so much interested in diagnosis for the sake of healing you. It's more diagnosis for the sake of whether or not we can keep you in the fight. Right? Um, we need to keep our people in the fight. Because as we look further on, we're going to see that about 22% of these people who get injured um, have traumatic brain injuries. And that's a pretty huge number. That's a lot of folks coming back with injuries. Okay? So we have to worry about that. One of the things that we do at uh, Wilderness Medical Associates, a company that I work for um, when, I met, when I met these guys, is, uh, is we talk about loss of consciousness or memory loss. Okay? Loss of consciousness or memory loss. So if you have any type of loss of consciousness or memory loss, you mean, that means your brain has been injured. You didn't just get whopped upside the head, your brain has been injured. Okay? And what happens is that that loss of consciousness can be very subtle. And I'm sure you guys have hit your head before and you get that little look, you know, you're seeing stars, you're not quite sure, you have kind of a blank moment, you lose a minute of time. That's loss of consciousness, even that subtleness. Okay? And I teach this course quite a bit up in the land of Maine area. And at this point in time, you know, a lot of those woodsmen, those loggers up there, they say to me, well, geez, um, you mean to tell me every time I get rocked upside the head, wake up in the woods, I should go see a doctor? Yes. Yes, you should. Why well, wouldn't get any work done. Wouldn't get any done at all. I get locked upside the head all the time. I'm like, you need another profession. You need to find some other work, okay, because you're going to be dangerous. You're going to die up there in the woods, okay? When you get knocked unconscious, you need to go get evaluated, all right? That's not a normal state of things, not a normal state at all, okay? Or if you don't get knocked unconscious, but you can't keep your memory, you don't know what happened, or you can't retain new memory, you have a brain injury. Your brain is injured, and it's going to be, and you're going to have some problems with that. Because once your brain is injured, you can have some other issues, right? So we look at altered mental status that can come from this, all right? We can look at it a couple of different ways why people's brain doesn't work, okay? Hypovolemia, what's that? What's that Latin? Do you mind, you guys take Latin? No? Spanish. Spanish? Low volume, low volume, when you're dehydrated, right? When you're dehydrated. Hypoxia, low oxygen. Could drugs mess up your brain? Yeah, a little bit. Alcohol, what do you think? Just a bit. Hyperglycemia, low blood sugar? Could that be problematic? Yeah? If you just have a wicked headache, could that wreck your day enough to have some altered mental status? Yes. Well, what we're looking for is some of these things are going to put you in some altered mental status, and it's going to be a lot of mood issue. The other part that we're looking for is whether or not your personality is changing. Okay? That's what we're looking for as well. Loss of consciousness, memory loss, and personality changes that goes with altered mental status. No, not just I'm grumpy because I haven't had a cookie lately, but I'm an entirely different person. All right? and, this is, and, you, and you guys have never seen this before at family outings, right? You have the backyard barbecue, right? and Uncle Bob is in the corner, and uh, boy, he never says a word at these things. He just comes to eat and leaves, and then a couple of margaritas down, he's like ch chattering away. Okay, telling jokes that aren't even funny, wondering why the hell no one's listening to him, right? And then a couple more, I think he's like dancing on the table, and you're like, wow, that's not Uncle Bob, <laughs> right? And then he's like taking off his clothes, dancing on the table, and you're like, ooh, this is going to go bad, and mom and dad are going to make me fix it, right? No, 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 keep your clothes on, and then he falls off the table, and you got to take, bad, these things happen. That's someone's brain going bad, okay? That is someone's brain going bad, and they're, they're having some injury, okay? This traumatic brain injury is part of it. When you're looking at someone who's whacked their heads, the, the be <laughs> let me just tell you, if you see Tom Cruise or Mel Gibson do medicine in a movie, whatever you do, don't do that. Okay? Whatever you do, don't do that. It doesn't happen that way. Um, and we do a lot of fixing of medicine from, from Tom Cruise and Mel Gibson. All right? So what happens is that we have this thing with the pupils. Everyone wants to look at the pupils. You guys watch House? You watch any other, under, other uh, medical show? What are they? they always look at the pupils. What are they looking for? Yeah, what they're looking for dilation. Why? Because your brain is swelling in your head, pushing that pupil to dilate. Unfortunately, this is a very late sign. Okay? And unlike Tom Cruise, I don't know any medic that can take a flashlight, look in somebody's eyes, and see that there's a brain charge in their head. Okay? That just doesn't work. That doesn't work either. 
But when you're looking at their eyes and you're seeing that pupil dilated, that's a very late sign. We want to look at things that are going to be a little bit earlier than that. Okay? These are the things that we're going to have. We're going to have some headache. We're going to have some nausea. We might have some ringing in the ears. Okay? There might be some double vision problems for this person. And what we're really worried about, really worried about, is that increasing intracranial pressure, increasing ICP. That's the one that'll get you. Because here, feel your head. Feel your head. Is it hard or soft? Yeah. Are there any places that crunch in there? Yeah. Feel, you're not, no, it's, it should be hard. <laughs> okay? It should be hard. It's called a cranial vault for a reason. Because okay? your brain's inside there and needs to be protected. So what happens is that if your brain swells, as all tissue that is injured or insulted does, it's going to swell inside that cranial vault. And as it starts to swell, where does it have to go? Out where? <laughs> yeah, your, it, okay, brain out your ears. Does that sound like a good thing? No. no. Generally speaking, it's going to go right down your frame and magnum. It's going to go right down your hole that, that your uh, spinal cord goes through. Okay? As that happens, that means you are starting to die. Yeah. As your brain starts to squeeze itself through your hole that, uh, that the spinal cord goes through. Yeah? So when we look at this, we want to see some early and late signs, right? Early and late signs. I think it's actually on the next slide. Our early signs are a severe headache. If you get whacked upside the head, will your head hurt? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, when your brain starts to swell, when you ask people how bad is your headache on a scale of 1 to 10, they're going to say 15, 20. They might be sitting there holding their head, rocking back and forth. Okay, this is beyond a migraine headache. This is the worst headache they've possibly had in their entire life. Okay? One of the other things that you're going to see is persistent vomiting. Persistent cyclical vomiting. So you whack yourself upside the head, everyone gets one free puke. Fair enough? Hit your head hard enough, you may have to puke. You puke, that's fine. You puke again, you puke again, you puke again, your brain is swelling. And if your brain is swelling, you're starting to die, you need to be fixed. Okay, some of the light signs are that blown pupil that we talked about, some posturing, as you start to do one of these things, okay, and then seizures, seizure coma death. This is you dying. So recognizing this early, I think that might be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So the moral of this story is that did you injure your brain when you hit your head? And we know this through loss of consciousness. We know this through memory loss. And we know this through altered mental status that can't be explained anywhere else. And if you did injure your brain, it's going to start to swell. And how bad is that swelling going to happen? We're going to watch for these things. How do we fix this stuff? How do you fix someone's brain swelling? Hmm? Yeah, they literally pull out a Makita and be like, and put some holes in there. Okay? This lecture is not long enough for me to teach you how to do that. Maybe in the next series. Okay? Certainly. But this is something that you want a neurologist to do in a hospital. So it doesn't make sense anyone seeing signs like these to bring them to a hospital. Yeah, yeah, absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. Now, just because you injure your brain, does it mean you will get increasing ICP? Not necessarily, because you have a little space there. You can swell for a little bit, okay? And that's the problem, right? Because people, I hit my head all the time. I get knocked out all the time, no problem at all. <coughs> it's no worry. Well, that one time when it does happen, it's going to get you. It's going to get you. So you got to be mindful of it, all right? Increasing ICP is what we're looking for, and that needs to be uh, treated by a doctor, okay? Make them comfortable if you can. As you start to vomit, what do you think is going to happen to your airway? Do we want to breathe vomit? Yeah, no. <laughs> That's bad. I don't want to breathe vomit. You guys can breathe vomit, right? I don't want to breathe vomit. So what you need to do is make sure the airway is open. They're not choking on anything. Get them some rest and get them to definitive care. You got to get them to a doctor. You got to get them to a hospital, okay? And you got to recognize that their brain is swelling. Who knows? Liam Nielsen, Neeson, right? What happened to his wife, Natasha Richardson, up in Canada a couple years ago? Oh, yeah. Whacked her head. Whacked her head. Head and brain injury. She went to sleep. There we go. Died. Died. Dead. Okay? Normally healthy adult. Gone. These things should have been recognized. And they tried to, 
Um, but what happened was she, she didn't want the care. She refused the care. Okay. How does whacking your head match up with PTSD? What do you think? Can you see in your head? All right, so I'm, again, the youngest of seven kids. And boy, if you were bleeding or bones weren't sticking out, you weren't hurt. That was the deal. Okay, if I didn't have insides on my outsides, I was not hurt. I should stop crying immediately before they gave me a reason to cry. Okay, that was it. <laughs> it was a rough household. Okay, there were just two kinds of people, the quick and the hungry. That's kind of how it went, right? <laughs> so what had happened was we, have, we grew up, and I grew up in an, in an age and a generation that if you couldn't see the injury, it didn't exist. Okay? And we know this to be a whole lot different now. We know this to be really critically different. When we look at this, we say, geez, 22% of all the combat casualties coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan post-Vietnam are brain injuries. 22%. That is huge. That's absolutely huge. As especially as opposed to in Vietnam era, it was 12%. So we've almost doubled our, our rate of whacking ourselves in the brain. Okay? Mostly because of the explosions versus being shot. Okay. If you're being shot, if you're shot in the head, what are you? Yeah, yeah dead. That would be dead. That would be mostly dead, if not all dead. Okay. But one of the problems is if people whack their head enough, they could have some residual issues. They can have some post-concussive syndromes. They can have some headaches. They can have some things that, that you know make them a little bit worried. They could have nightmares. Okay. They can have uh, 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 trouble having ability controlling their emotions. Okay. Any of those things, when they first happen to you, you say to yourself, and then you start talking to yourself, right? You're like, wait a minute. I, I, am I crazy or not? And then you have this, well, maybe I am crazy. No, maybe I'm not crazy. I'm talking to myself, so that, and I'm answering myself, so maybe I am crazy. I don't know. No, it's bad being crazy. I'm not going to be crazy. I can, I, can, I can get myself through this. I can will myself not to be crazy. right? And this is what happens with people, because there's such a stigma attached to this that people don't fess up to it. They don't want to, especially rough and tumble soldiers, they don't want to say, I feel, I'm feeling emotional today. <laughs> Shoot you myself. Okay? That's what happens. Right? They can't be doing that. So what we need to worry about is people with some of these residual effects because it happens. It absolutely happens. Right? 80%, 68% of, of casualties with blast injuries of, of itself, they have this TBI. When I was over there, we had 6,500 people in our brigade um, that I took care of medically. We, had, we came back with over 1,200 blast reports. 1,200 blast reports. And we're tracking all those people now to make sure that they don't have these issues a year, two years later. Because what happens is that, oh, there it's not in the last one, okay, is that they don't report them until too late. Okay? They don't report them. They have these mild TBIs, right? So of these 80%, about 80% of that is a, is a mild TBI. I can go back in the field. I went back in the field. They looked at me. They said I was fine. I lied my way through the MACE test. They said I was fine. It's not a big deal. I went back. And I supported my buddies, and I fought the fight, and then I got home. And then after about being home for half a month or so, two months, maybe six months, I started to relax a little bit, because I wasn't being shot at on a regular basis. And, I, and, and trust me, if you wear a gun because you're afraid of being killed every day for a year, it takes a little while to get used to that. And it takes a little while to not get used to that. The first two or three months when I come back from those things, you go to a restaurant, and you stand up, and you're looking. You're looking. What am I looking for? My gun. Bombs. Where's my gun? <laughs> hey, oh, when I'm driving still, I look for the, the booby traps, right? You look for those things, because if you don't, what is the penalty f for that failure? Yeah. Dead. So you take it seriously, and you do these things. It takes you a little while to get back into the, to the transition of life. And then you end up with, with emotional issues. You end up with, I can't sleep very well, OK? And there's challenges with diagnosing this. One, people don't come forward. Two, people had an event their first week that they were in war, stayed there for a year, came back, took them six months to get down, and now they end up 18 months later with issues. Do you think that's a little difficult to track back to one event that they got blown up the first week they were in, in, in country? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Add to that the other diagnostic issues of there's a lot of, why do you think they call it um, PTSD? What, is the, the, what does the D stand for? Disorder. disorder. Okay. Syndromes and disorders, what are those? <laughs> Things we're not really sure yet. 
but we have a lot of symptoms for. And they seem to be like consistent. So what we're going to do is we're going to put them all together and say that these symptoms make this disorder. Okay? Do you think that's hard to diagnose? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is one of the problems. Okay? This is absolutely one of the problems. So diagnostics, um, procedures are hard. Uh, collaboration and making sure that all the doctors are on the same page is difficult. Okay? These are all problems to establish whether or not somebody's got PTSD. Not to mention the fact that being labeled PTSD is a tough thing. Okay? It's a tough thing. So being aware of some of these things and as they affect some of your classmates and some of the people in your life is important. It's one of those, those life lessons that 15 years from now, you're going to be saying to yourself, geez, you know what? I got a kid. I was in a car, he was in a car wreck, and, and you know, he just learned how to drive, and it was snowy and icy, and he flipped his car, and he whacked his head. He said he was fine. He's, that was like eight, nine months ago, but he's, you know what? He's not the same. Not the same. What the heck is going on? These things are going on. These little things will catch up with them. Okay? So you got to make sure you're, you're watching for them. What can we do for it? Treat what we find. Treat what we find. Okay, the cool thing about this is the different modalities that are being explored. Okay? Um, I, in Afghanistan, some of the treatment for these folks being blown up was acupuncture. We happened to be there with the Koreans at the time, um, the South Koreans, and uh, they brought in acupuncture into the hospital there in Afghanistan. We can't get acupuncture paid for, for through the VA now, uh, but certainly while you're in theater, you can get poked. What do you think? There's a lot of other um, alternatives out there. What, what's another alternative modality? What do you think? For people with injuries, huh? Um, yeah, we have the normal sit down and talk to a shrink therapy, right? Who wants to do that? Yeah, nobody wants to do that, right? OK, how about um, there's some other therapies that are out there. Equine therapy is, make, is coming on the rise that they're looking at, um, working with animals, doing some occupational therapy, that sort of thing. It's a little bit better. Okay. Um, there's Reiki. There's uh, a lot of yoga that's out there, um, chiropractic, which just recently got added to the, you can use this and have the government pay for it because you're broken, okay? but previously was not paid for, massage therapy, any of those therapies that are out there. So there's a lot of things that are, pe that are working on that the government's working on, but unfortunately the government moves in a pretty sla snail's place. Okay? You guys, how long are you in this school for? Forever. Forever. <laughs> okay? The government, they move slower than that. <laughs> they move slower than that. So you have to be worried about that. Okay? All right, so um, uh, if we can turn it off. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? How long did it take for you to get over your sort of like post um, I, still, uh, I still have triggers and, um, that make me angry, like high school students. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, no, my name is Soren, I have PTSD. It took me, I had PTSD from my Iraq event. Um, I didn't sleep. Uh, a lot of it was sleep dep deprivation. Um, I, there was only two days out of the year that I slept eight hours. Uh, every other day I was just randomly hours, and it took me two years after, after I got back to get into a regular sleep pattern, um, which is a little bit problematic. Uh, certainly, um, you know, I do have some triggers that bring, that, that'll, uh, you know, trigger nightmares as well. Okay. But it everyone is different, right? Everyone, it's, it's, a, it's a long, it's a long process for anyone to get through this. this. Okay, I operate on a, on a regular basis, and heck, they even sent me back to war again. Go figure. They, were, they weren't afraid I'd kill anybody. I would have been. Kidding. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Yeah? No, are mild. Are mild traumatic brain injuries. Okay, so mild and, yeah, and it's the mild one that is more likely to cause PTSD than not, right? Because it's the one that people get away with. Your head is whacked open, and you have like brains hanging out, and they manage to save you. Do they expect you to have some psychological issues? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they treat you ahead of time for that. There's a lot of modalities out there, okay? Um, but if you get whacked in the head and you say you're fine, does anyone even know? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. But these are, you know, it's something that you have to really be, be mindful of. And here's the other part of this, okay? We treat P PTSD like any other psychiatric disorder. And here's the secret about psychiatric disorders, okay? They can go the whole gamut 
of how they affect your lives, one, and two, time-wise, how acute they are. So for example, if you sprain your ankle, how long are you down? A couple weeks maybe? Not that much? Not that hard to deal? You, you, you know, you, must, you miss a couple of games in basketball and that's about it? All right, you break your leg, how long are you out for? Season. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing with these psychiatric disorders. Same thing with, these, with the PTSD, right? You have people who have acute events and they have problems that they can't manage and then you have people with longer events that it's gonna affect them for the rest of their lives, okay? Especially if they don't learn how to manage it. Uh, we had one guy, uh, he was one of my favorite uh, PTSD patients. He was having a really hard time. We went over to Afghanistan and a month later, uh, he was in a rollover accident and uh, he couldn't reach the guy behind him to get him out and uh, the guy, did live, but they were in a ditch underwater, and he could not get his buddy. Okay, and uh, they ended up getting to him, and they got him out in time, and they saved his life. But the fact that he couldn't do it weighed on him heavy. It weighed on him heavy. So they were thinking about sending him home because he didn't want to go out in the trucks. He he couldn't do anything. He was having a really tough time, and we're like, this guy is a 30-year soldier. He's, he's, he's quality stuff. We're not just going to let you throw him to the wind of, of VA-ness. Okay? We're going to take care of him. So basically his job, um, he came to my office to work. He was a supply guy. And his job every day was to stand by the door and greet people. Because that was about all he could do. Okay? He, could stand, he couldn't do any supply stuff, couldn't drive the trucks, couldn't do anything. But boy, he could stand there by the door and greet people. And after the first week, he like started to like it, right? At the first week, he was like, this is punishment. This sucks. I can't believe you're doing this to me, right? <coughs> then after the first week, he was like, hey, good morning. What can we help you with, you know? <laughs> okay, about two or three weeks later, and what would happen is that as he was waiting there at the door, right outside my door, he would sit there and talk to me, tell me all about what was going on in his head. Talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Three weeks later, he's like, you know what? I think I'd like to get you some Band-Aids. I can do some supply stuff. Suddenly, he's back in the game, okay? He's back in the game. The guy just retired after 30 years of service, um, and, he's, and he's all right, okay? Sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. Sometimes it takes a longer time. All depends, okay? Any other questions? I'm working at time. Yes? My, uh, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, my father was in um, the Army for a short period of time and absolutely hated it. Uh, much to his dismay, my oldest brother uh, was one of the first Green Berets, um, and uh, he got out after a while, but then I went in again, so, yeah. Not quite in the family blood, but I don't know. I'm the only left-handed person in the family, too, so maybe the mailman brought me or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, why did you decide to join the Army uh, as opposed to other branches of the military? I was in the Coast Guard for a while, and I really loved the Coast Guard, but, uh, you know, I, I, honest was, I honestly was in a time in my life where I'm just like, I want to just go have fun. And I thought I would be there for a year or two. And I literally, I'm like, I'm just going to shoot things and blow things up and have a good time and not carry a word, you know, not a worry in the world. Um, and, uh, and I was in for a while, and I was doing some really cool stuff. Uh, they had me working with uh, chemical biological weapons, which was scary, OK, very scary stuff. Um, and then 9-11 uh, went down. And that changed everything. Changed everything. Changed everything. How old were you guys when 9-11 happened? I am so old. Do you guys remember? Where were you? School? School, yeah. This is East Coast, right? Yep, 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 yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Is that it? Anything? All right, well, I appreciate you having me here. Thank you.